This 2013 era budget gaming build from my previous video is like a metaphor for how things are going IRL. It wasn't looking too bad for a while, but things started to fall apart around the start of the 2020s. It's not that modern games refuse to start, more that when they do, they run like ass. In this follow-up, I'm going to see if I can save this potato PC with just one single upgrade. The challenge is, with a PC this bad, where do I start? From a modern perspective, the 2013 budget build has a couple of weak points in its spec. Well, okay, it's a collection of weak points held together with Phillips screws and hope. If you were the hypothetical owner of this PC in 2023, looking to breathe some new life into it rather than fork out on a whole new build, which single upgrade is going to have the biggest impact? It's a tough call, what with so many areas for improvement. The CPU is a Socket 1150i5 with 4 cores and no overclocking. The RAM is 8GB of relatively slow dual-channel DDR3. The graphics card is an officially obsolete 2GB Radeon R7260X. The storage is a well-worn 1TB hard drive from Seagate, and the power supply has only 350 watts, meaning some of my upgrade options are quite limited. The motherboard is an MSI Z97 PC mate. As the challenge is to upgrade only one single component, there's no way of swapping this out without also replacing a whole bunch of other components, so this will have to be one of the limiting factors of the build. That means the PC can support 4th and 5th generation CPUs, with the maximum upgrade possible being a Haswell i7 like the 4770K or 4790K, or a Broadwell i7-5775C. I happen to have the latter on hand already, so that's going to be the part that gets tested. It's arguably not superior to its Haswell predecessors, especially as my particular sample won't overclock above 4.2GHz, but with 4 extra threads, higher clocks, a large level 4 cache, and better IPC, this is a big upgrade over the i5-4570 and is much more in line with the needs of modern games. The motherboard can also, however, support much more RAM than I currently have installed. 8GB is the bare minimum for games these days, and with the GPU also being memory limited, that 8GB is going to run out pretty fast. To get around this, I'll be borrowing the 16GB DDR3-2400 kit from my CPU test rig. The initial build had frame pacing problems, aka stutter, which I put down to constantly having to access the page file. Hopefully, having 16GB of fast RAM on hand will reduce the need for that constant hard drive activity and smooth out the frame time graph. The alternative approach to that, however, is to get rid of the hard drive altogether. It seems to me like having to simultaneously access data and operate the page file is just too much for this aging 3.5 inch hard drive, whereas a solid state drive will handle this much better. This particular model doesn't support M.2 drives, but a simple SATA SSD should have much faster reads and writes than the old spinning platter. It doesn't completely resolve the issue of the RAM being overwhelmed, but it should have a noticeable effect on frame pacing. Of course, there's not much point in improving frame pacing if the frame times are too high. As graphics cards go, the R7260X is better than a kick in the teeth, but it doesn't take much of an upgrade to make a massive difference in processing power. Even the GTX 1650, a four-year-old low-power GPU, can offer more than twice the performance of the old Radeon, and thanks to its low TDP, it can be simply dropped in without requiring a PSU upgrade. Switching out the old 2GB GPU will also help ease some of the congestion elsewhere, as having double the memory on board should reduce the GPU's reliance on system RAM and therefore the page file. But which of these upgrades will have the biggest uplift in performance? Where should the hypothetical broke PC owner put their hard-earned money to get the most go for their dough? Having asked my community for their opinion, the overwhelming majority seems to think the GPU will have the biggest impact, with storage coming in a distant second place. Is it as simple as that? There's only one way to find out. The easiest upgrade possible is also one of the cheapest. The MSI Z97 PC Mate has four DDR3 RAM slots, and when I acquired it, only two were occupied. Adding an extra pair of 4GB sticks could be done for about £10, and can be installed in a matter of seconds, but I decided to go the extra mile and install the four 2400 speed DIMMs I use for CPU testing. 
Loading up the XMP profile is one minor extra step, but compared to the others, this is definitely the no-brainer upgrade. Not only that, but the performance difference is immediate too. Cyberpunk sees a 12% increase in average FPS, jumping from 27 to over 30, but that alone wouldn't make for a very playable experience. The 8GB setup suffered from single-digit 1% and 0.1% lows, and as a result was incredibly painful to play. The 16GB upgrade sees a huge jump in lows, and while there was some variety in results from one run to another, it's not unrealistic to see minimums in the teens and 20s. The Witcher 3 was no better than Cyberpunk in the PC's original potato configuration. In fact, if anything, it was a hell of a lot worse, with averages below even a cinematic 24fps. You might blame DX12 for the stutter, and it's true that this is often the case with this game, but I usually find that it goes away after a reload. However, these numbers were from my best run. With the extra 8GB installed, and once more ignoring the results from the first run, there was another pretty big increase in lows. Looking at the graphs and the percentage increases, it might look like the game went from unplayable to playable, however I do need to remind you that the average is only 23 FPS and is barely improved at all by the RAM increase. Spider-Man Remastered actually sees the smallest of drops in average FPS moving up to 16GB, but that doesn't seem too bad when considering what actually happens when playing the game on the default setup. When played on the potato, the game freezes for several seconds with only 8GB, so even if you think those single-digit lows are tolerable, the pauses in gameplay would get extremely hard to bear over time. The good news is that none of the upgrades, be it RAM, CPU, storage or GPU, experienced any kind of repeat of this issue, and the RAM upgrade saw a healthy increase in minimums to boot. The next cheapest upgrade would be the storage. A SATA SSD is a pretty cheap thing in the modern world, with used 120GB drives available for a tenner or less, and 1TB drives for just 60 quid brand new. I used what I had to hand, which was a 256GB crucial drive pulled out of an old disused photo kiosk from my previous workplace. Naturally, given the small size, I could only have one game at a time installed, and unless you do invest in a decent sized SSD, this will always be the downside of flash storage. As for ease of upgrading, this falls somewhere behind RAM. Not that 2.5 inch drives are hard to install, far from it, but in order to be useful, the drive needs to either have the original hard drive cloned onto it, not always possible if you're downgrading in capacity, or you have to sit through another Windows install and then put up with people on the internet moaning that you haven't activated it. A lot of people, myself included, expect this to have a massive performance difference, and in one respect we're quite correct. Starting the PC, and I don't just mean getting to the desktop, I mean once it's finally loaded up all the various background processes, the SSD reduces all of that to a fraction of the time of the old hard drive. Starting games, loading saves, reloading saves when the first run was ruined by shader compilation stutters, everything is just so much more pleasant with an SSD. But does this affect in-game performance? The expectation is yes, with only 8GB of system RAM and 2GB of video RAM, the system relies on storage for paging, essentially writing data to the drive when it doesn't fit in memory. Relying on a hard drive for paging can annihilate frame times, as I've shown in previous videos. In Cyberpunk, there's... Okay, that's actually a drop in averages. Uh, I, I accept that, I make my own benchmarking runs rather than using pre-made ones, so these things will happen. Still. It's a bit of a blow. 1% and 0.1% lows are a lot healthier though, increasing 5.5 and 4 times respectively, but this is not as big of a jump as I saw from the RAM upgrade, which saw bigger increases across the board. The differences are much closer in The Witcher 3, but still not in favour of the SSD. Averages are now about on par. 1% and 0.1% are up almost sevenfold compared to the hard drive, but RAM still has an overall advantage in terms of performance increase. Stutters are perhaps slightly less prevalent, but neither the SSD nor RAM upgrade completely resolves this, even after multiple test runs, and the game's still not what I'd call playable. 
Spider-Man's improvement over the hard drive run is, again, tangible, and this shouldn't be a surprise. As part of the promo for the remaster on PS5, Insomniac waxed lyrical about what they've been able to achieve using the console's new storage medium, so it's no surprise that trying to run the game off a hard drive is a bit of a bad idea. The SSD upgrade actually sees a small but measurable increase in average performance over the RAM upgrade, though one that's possibly within the margin of error. The 0.1% show that even flash storage isn't immune to the occasional stutter. The CPU upgrade doesn't need to be quite as expensive as I've made it. I used the i7-5775C, which I picked up for under £100, but which frequently goes for way more than that. And while it's a fine CPU, it doesn't really warrant that high price. An overclockable i7 for this socket can be had for as little as £55, locked versions are around £40, and Xeon equivalents cost even less than that. I picked this chip because I already had it on hand for a dedicated review, which should follow in a couple of weeks' time, but if I were actually buying the chip to upgrade the system, any one of the other 4-core 8-thread options would have been more realistic. The overclocked Haswells will also probably go higher. The Broadwell CPUs were 14 nanometer, but nowhere near as mature as the far higher clock chips that followed, and I can't find too many instances of people achieving much better OCs than I did. With this 600 megahertz boost, four extra threads, and 128 megabyte level 4 cache over the i5, have any effect? Surprisingly, yes. The three games I've chosen for this test are all open world titles, with plenty of AI controlled NPCs and objects and other CPU intensive activities putting pressure on the CPU. Cyberpunk's performance increase from the CPU upgrade falls somewhere between the previous two upgrades. The average FPS sees a small increase over the base measurement, the 1% result is roughly 10 times higher than the original build can manage, but point ones were still disappointingly low, and arguably weren't really noticeably better than before. Witcher 3's average is the biggest jump over the base spec the game has seen so far, though again, probably only within the margin of error. The lows, however, are the worst increase seen so far. To be clear, there's still an improvement over the i5 in the default potato spec, but the difference is small enough that you'd probably have to play them side by side to even notice. Spider-Man, on the other hand, actually does remarkably well. Again, the game didn't stop for a moment in order to order in textures, so it beats the original spec by default, but its 1% and 0.1% low scores some of the biggest boosts so far. I admit this was a pretty surprising result, as both the minimum and recommended specs for the game feature a 4th Gen i5. Finally, the most expensive upgrade. The best graphics card I had on hand that I could guarantee would work with a 350 watt PSU was my MSI Low Profile GTX 1650. This variant doesn't need external power, so actually fetches a somewhat higher price than regular models. A regular version would still be acceptable, however. The card it's replacing, the R7260X, has a 115 watt TDP and uses a 6 pin connector for power but any higher-end models, like a GTX 1660 or RX 5600 XT, would probably benefit from a PSU upgrade on top, and that's not within the scope of this challenge. Anyway, with that in mind, when I asked the question in my community tab, this option won by a pretty big margin, so a lot of people expect this to have the biggest impact on performance. Well, I can tell you right now, you were actually right, in a way. I tested the GTX 1650 with a Ryzen 5 5600X the other day, so I know what the GPU is capable of when not being constrained by other factors. It's fair to say then that the i5, 8GB of RAM and spinning rust are still taking their toll here. The average in Cyberpunk is 40fps, a 46% increase over the old R7, but only two thirds of the GPU's maximum potential. Also, frame pacing is still absolutely atrocious. In fact, it feels worse than the Radeon, probably due to the greater relative gap between the average frame time and the minimum. 
Putting a cap on the frame rate might help somewhat, but it's not going to fix the issue completely. Which are three fares better, the average is now a completely playable 50 FPS, and 1% lows are tolerable on paper, but they're only as low as they are because of the near constant stutter. The point ones tell the story, a 4 FPS minimum only looks good when compared to the stock results, and is a small improvement over the CPU upgrade, but RAM and SSD both result in slightly less hitching. In Spider-Man, however, the GTX 1650 sweeps the board, averages past 60, almost up to 70 FPS, and while 1% and 0.1% aren't as good as they could be on another system, they're still improved by a greater degree than with any other upgrades so far. Does that make the graphics card the ideal single upgrade? The one thing to improve them all? Well, depending on the game, kinda, yeah. I don't like giving people the news that the most expensive option is the correct one, but in this case it's hard to deny. It won't always be the case, however. If your system looks like this, but already has something like a GTX 970 or RX 470, you'll find that any GPU upgrades are a waste of time in modern titles until you've resolved the other issues. And in that regard, I think the RAM is actually the biggest limitation to FPS. SSD storage is certainly a must-have in any PC from a sheer quality of life perspective, but the numbers here are pretty clear that the 16GB upgrade has the bigger impact on frames per second. So, after all that, you're probably wondering, what happens if I put in all the upgrades at once? I was wondering that too. I mean, it doesn't really add anything to the point I'm making, but... It would make for a nice, satisfying conclusion to the video, wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe we'll look at it in another video. Thanks for watching. Oh, f it, go on then. I won't leave you hanging like that. With my fully armed and operational budget gaming rig, Cyberpunk really took off. The 50 FPS average is still less than the Ryzen test platform could extract from this GPU, but a whopping 10 FPS higher than the previous GTX 1650 test result, and 20 FPS above anything I got from the original Radeon. 1% and 0.1% are both pretty acceptably smooth as well, though even the upgraded CPU does struggle a little. <clears throat> though even the upgraded CPU does struggle a bit around some areas of Night City. The Witcher 3 was barely recognisable, averaging 60 FPS and dropping only into the 40s. Even on the second test run, the stutter struck a couple of times, but on the whole the experience was infinitely smoother than anything beforehand, and I think you might even get away with a less aggressive FSR setting. Finally, Spider-Man might be a candidate for some higher settings, as you really don't need to play this game at over 100 FPS. Drops were much less objectionable than before, if still lower than a new system might get, but on the whole, this is a better experience than I think many might expect for a PS5 port. On the whole though, you probably shouldn't do this. I paid about £120 for the original Potato PC, including the R7260X and i5-4570, which were actually upgrades. Factoring in everything else, the final form comes to in excess of £450. If you owned a Potato PC like this one, you could probably sell it, either whole or in parts, for about what I paid for it, maybe a little less. With a total of £450 to spend on newer components, you could probably come up with something more compelling in terms of value and future expandability. That may be the subject for a future video, but in the meantime, I'm looking forward to hearing what you'd do with that kind of budget. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.